Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Merida, Venezuela, by Paul Dobson. He's a journalist at Venezuela Analysis. In Caracas, we have Phil Gunson, a senior Venezuela analyst at the International Crisis Group. And joining us from Washington, D.C., is Pedro Mario Burelli. He's a former executive board member of Venezuela's state-owned oil firm, the largest company in Latin America at the time. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Pedro Mario Burelli, let me start with you. Second term for Maduro, six more years. Does he deserve it? Well, he doesn't deserve it because a way to become president is to hold free and fair elections. And what happened in May 20th was neither free nor fair. And that is the real problem that we're dealing with today. This is the end of a first period, an election that he won, also quite contested, uh, with a lot of uh, doubts about how the vote was counted then. So clearly, if he wanted to get a second mandate, he should have gone through a proper election where everybody who, could, who wanted to participate could participate, where the rules were clear, where the Electoral Council had been elected in the form that the Constitution mandates. So we're dealing with a crisis that is man-made. It's made by one man, Nicolás Maduro, who opted to stay in power by playing with institutions and using the institutions of democracy in order to perpetuate himself in power. That's Paul, a crisis okay. we have. Paul Dobson, the man doesn't have a mandate from his people, and he's created a crisis in the country. He shouldn't have another six years, according to the other guests. What do you think? Well, I find it quite uh, ironic that the fact that the electoral system hasn't changed in Venezuela significantly over the last seven to eight years, um, yet certain spokesperson, including your, your last guest, um, choose to recognize some elections but not others. Uh, we're using the same electoral system we've used in Venezuela for the last few years uh, for the Electoral Assembly elections in, in 2015, for example, uh, and a series of other elections. And all of the international observers, independent international observers who are here on the ground, uh, unlike your previous guest, who I understand wasn't in Venezuela at the time, uh, the people who were here who inspected the electoral system in, in May uh, decided that it was free, fair, transparent and independent as an uh, electoral system. Therefore, the results can be, can be trusted to be the genuine results of the Venezuelan people. The real problem in the country right now, no matter who you speak, speak to Phil Gunson is that the economy is a wreck and people are suffering. Now, I guess the main point of division here is whether Maduro wrecked it or it was a medley of forces both inside and outside. Where do you stand on this, Phil? Well, if you look at what has happened since Maduro came to power, the economy has shrunk by around 50 percent and we now have inflation of well over a million percent a year. Um, it's hard to see how he can escape responsibility for that. But, of course, the problems didn't begin with Maduro. They began lo a long time ago with Chavez, uh, his predecessor and political mentor, um, who opted for a, a, an, an economic policy which, although during the period of high oil prices it was possible to uh, maintain disguising the underlying problems, uh, once the oil price fell, and the problems accumulated, uh, the chickens came home to roost, if you like. And Maduro, on the one hand, has inherited what, what Chavez um, produced, what Chavez laid the groundwork for. And on the other, he's successively failed, despite repeatedly promising uh, a fresh uh, economic uh, package, he's repeatedly failed to resolve the problems that have, that have arisen. I want to have a little listen to a Venezuelan migrant, someone fleeing the country, Dario Lea, I'll have a little listen, everyone, and we'll pick up after that. Over there in Venezuela, there is no life at all. With the wages, you can't even afford to buy some soap, to take a shower, nothing. Even if you have two, three, four different wages, it's not enough. Paul Dobson, the place seems to be quite unlivable for hundreds of thousands of people, even millions of people. And to what extent can you accept that those in charge are responsible for this? Without a doubt, those in charge have got to uh, put their hands up and, and, and take their share of the responsibility for the current economic situation. Um, very rarely will you hear in the international press the fact that they actually do do this. In a very recent interview, only a week ago, the president uh, recognized that there are economic failings uh, of his mandate. Um, I don't think anyone is contesting this. Um, where we maybe would differ in is, is looking at the original causes of the situation um, and the solutions. For example, 
I would agree with what your previous speaker, Philip, uh, mentioned, that Maduro has, in fact, inherited a lot of these problems from Chavez. But I would also add that Chavez inherited a lot of these problems from the 40 years of right-wing governments before him. The number one problem caused in the Venezuelan economic situation is that Venezuela is heavily dependent on oil. That is the situation. It produces almost nothing else and has to import everything that it consumes. This means that it's dependent on exchange rates, it depends on, dependent on international trade and a whole range of other factors, which haven't helped in right. creating a solution okay. when, economic, when the oil price is dipped. Okay, so let me, let me ask Pedro. So, Pedro, you have the sanctions coming from the United States and, and, and the West, right? Cash shortages as a result of that, meaning they can't produce the oil that they need in order to spur the economy. Isn't the West partly to blame here? Not at all. The reason the, the real sanction that has been imposed on Venezuela, and as the previous guest said, a highly dependent uh, country on oil, made even more dependent by the fact that all other sectors of the economy were destroyed by Hugo Chavez by expropriating agricultural land, appropriate, or expropriating businesses. I mean, this is a country that has one of the best agricultural land in the world and doesn't produce any food. Why is that? Because the government went out on a massive expropriation. They actually prefer to import food. As a matter of fact, today, they are importing food from Turkey um, after having spent some time importing food from Mexico and others mm -hmm. on their very corrupt schemes. Once those schemes were discovered, they've now moved to do those out of Turkey. The real problem here is not sanctions. The real problem here is the economic management. Hugo Chavez fired 23,000 people the top management of that company that the country depended on. There are consequences. Those consequences, we're seeing them right now. When Chavez arrived in power, we delivered to him a company that produced 3.3 million barrels of oil. Today, it produces barely a million at incredibly high cost. And of course, that is not enough to maintain a country that's wholly dependent. But to blame that on, to blame that on, on sanctions, when the guy who's running the oil company right now is a National Guard general with zero experience, and they actually have turned this company into one of the biggest money laundering operations uh -huh. in the world? Come on, okay? The sanctions that should be imposed on PDVSA should have even been stronger, given that they moved from producing oil to laundering the profits of Latin American or uh, drug cartels. That's the reality of what's going on, and that's why it's producing one million barrels of oil. Not enough to maintain a country, much less a country that is not producing any food, because Chavez preferred to destroy the sector and get his military friends rich by importing food rather than whatever. But when you run out of foreign exchange, you cannot import food. Paul That's Dobson? the problem. Yes, well, it's, it's uh, certain elements of this are uh, true, but it's also worth pointing out that Venezuela didn't produce food before Chavez either. Venezuela has been dependent of oil since the 1930s, more or less, with an ever-greasing uh, frequency. Um, this isn't a new phenomenon. This phenomenon has, has, has come from a long time before. And the, it's worth pointing out that the fires, the, the, the amount of people that, that the government had to uh, sack from the oil industry was due to a, a coup d'etat, which they tried to launch against the country. It was a crime carried out by a number mm -hmm. of people in the oil industry. Uh, and, and logically, they were fired from the post because of this. Phil Gunson, at the International Crisis Group, your mandate is to try and put out fires, to analyze problems and to come up with solutions, right? We look at the Lima Group, 13 of the 14 in the Lima Group, not very happy with Maduro, don't recognize this new six-year mandate. Only Mexico left-leaning government saying we won't stick our noses in other people's businesses. Looking at the zeitgeist, when we see that we have Donald Trump as the U.S. president, we have Mr. Bolsonaro in Brazil, Ivan Duque in Colombia, all of them no friends to Maduro. Is it helpful or harmful that they're taking a tough stance on him? Well, I think it's inevitable that they're going to take a tough stance on him, and it's appropriate that they should. I mean, the hemisphere decided um, in the framework of the Organization of American States some time ago that being a democracy was a condition um, for being recognized and treated as an equal uh, in the Americas. And, and clearly, what we, what we have now in, in Venezuela doesn't meet those criteria. They should be taking it seriously, and they should be adopting a tough stance, not least because in many cases, and you mentioned Colombia and Brazil in particular, they are receiving um, tens of thousands, in the case of Colombia, over a million 
refugees from Venezuela, their own countries, their own economies are suffering. Um, and they need a solution to this. Uh, now, is that on its own enough? No, certainly not. Um, it's impossible, I think, for the outside world to fix the problem of Venezuela unless there is an internal uh, partner, if you like. And mm -hmm. the problem has been in the recent past that the opposition has not uh, come together around a coherent planning coordination uh, with, with external critics that would permit uh, the restoration of democracy. And that's one of the things that needs to be fixed, I think. Pedro Mario Borelli, with the current pieces on the board, that constitutional assembly that was set up by Maduro, Maduro's presidency himself, would you have any trust in those institutions to reform from within? I think it's impossible, and I think we've actually come. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, as if nothing's going to happen in the next few days. I think it is very significant that Maduro will not be recognized by a number of people, and that maybe the government that emerges from the legitimate National Assembly, which, by the way, is agreeing a little bit with what Phil just said right now, was the result of the opposition getting together and gaining control of the parliament. And it is that fact that Maduro did not accept that the opposition won the parliament. He went in to gut that parliament to create this parallel illegal structure called the National uh, Constituent Assembly. I mean, this is a fight that we've had. This fight really exacerbated the moment the opposition finally got together and got the majority of the National Assembly. That should have led to a negotiation, to a, a cohabitation, to some sort of cooperation, but it actually led to even more uh, radicalization on the part of the government. So clearly what we have right now, as we're speaking, because it is the 10th of, of January, which is where Maduro's term ends, and suddenly we understand that the guy, there is no recognized elected president. And it is important what I'm saying. The fact that Maduro can hold on and usurp power creates a problem, because he will not be recognized. And then we have a challenge. What if the world opts, the largest, all the regional powers, and Europe decides to recognize Mr. Guaido, who is the president of the legitimate National Assembly, which everybody recognizes as the sole legitimate institution at this point? This is the crisis that we're dealing with today. It's a crisis between somebody who opts to usurp power from midnight tonight to the fact that the legitimate, under the Venezuelan constitution, the legitimate steps are that the National Assembly has to name a president to fill the vacuum. And that president has to be, in the first instance, the president of the National Assembly. So in the next 24 hours, we're mm -hmm. bound to find this clash between a guy who does not want to leave and an international community that is mostly and principally in terms of the countries that affect Venezuela, aligned with the possibility of recognizing a government that emerges from the National Assembly. Paul Dobson, does it feel to you like that clash is imminent? Um, I, I would say no. I mean, your, your previous speaker used the word legit, legitimate a lot. Um, anyone who uses this word, I presume, has read the Venezuelan constitution, which was passed the year after he left the country. Uh, and according to the Venezuelan constitution, the uh, National Constituent Assembly is perfectly legal. The uh, National Assembly, which was elected under the same electoral system which was used in May, I should point out, um, has been declared in contempt of court for around three years now. Um, and the president, assuming power after, after elections, is also completely legitimate and within Venezuelan law. The question here is, legitimate according to who? Legitimate according to uh, American standards, Trump standards, and so on, or legitimate according to Venezuelan law under the principles of the international law of self-determination uh, and according to the Venezuelan people's right to choose? This is a question which, which is being debated at the moment in Venezuela. And the people in Venezuela are, there's a, a vivid debate going on, both within the opposition sectors, the pro-government sectors, on the streets, in the offices, and so on. No? But the, the only true um, way to, to judge this debate is in the elections. And we can see that in the elections that the vast majority of, of the people who oppose the government either chose not to vote, or have left the country, or have not registered to vote or voted for one of the three opposition candidates who ran against Maduro in May. Well, there's a lot of pain at the moment, economic suffering that is beating into political issues right now. There are major issues facing Venezuela right now. We'll be keeping a close eye 
on the country for the moment. Gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us. Paul Dobson, Phil Gunson and Pedro Mario Borelli. Thanks again.